My name is Palmira Granados. I work at the Center of Genomics and Policy. Um, um, I'm, I'm a lawyer in Mexico. I specialize in intellectual property. Um, in the Center of Genomics and Policy, I work on the legal, social, and ethical aspects of um, genomics, medicine, and anything related to that. Uh, and today, I'm going to talk to you about commercialization. Um, hi. I'm gonna I'm gonna focus on the, trying to to address the concerns of uh, the population. I notice that most of you are um, doctoral students, master students. There are some postdoctoral, and I think there are two staff people. I don't know if they actually came, but so this is gonna be my presentation. I'm going to start with the objective, then I'm going to talk about what commercialization is, uh, the tools, and then I'm going to break it down into intellectual property and the different ways to use that intellectual property. Um, then I'm going to talk about some alternatives to the traditional intellectual property commercialization scheme, uh, talk about the advantages, concerns, and and at the end of the presentation, I'm going to have a little exercise. Uh, so I, I distributed some boards, and you're going to get in, in groups and uh, discuss how to best commercialize a product that I chose. Um, probably the groups are going to be between three and four people per group. And then we're going to have a discussion about whether you actually learn how to commercialize. The purpose of this presentation is to initiate and stimulate discussions on issues related to commercialization and its alternatives. Um, if you want specific information about um, any of the uh, resources that the university has, you can go to any of these uh, websites. I can make uh, available of all my slides for you at the end, so you can actually click on there and find whatever information you need. Um, so, does any one of you know what commercialization is? Basically, is a process by which we try to extract an economic value out of new products, processes, and knowledge. And we do this through the use of intellectual property rights and other different tools that use intellectual property rights, such as licensing agreements, spin-off companies, public-private partnerships and open innovation models. Why do we want to commercialize? And basically the answer is that um, innovation can lead to economic growth, not only for the company or not only for the inventor, but also for a region and for countries in general. If you think about um, Palo Alto, for instance, that region is, uh, it has been growing uh, technologically speaking, and that has attracted a lot of um, marketing of people wanting to work there and the creation of uh, companies, and that has created jobs and has created economic growth for the region. Um, also, innovation can result in scientific, technological, and academic advancement per se. Innovation, as I said, can create jobs and can bring about uh, societal well-being by creating products that actually make uh, societies function better. And the uh, importance of universities, for instance, 17% uh, of the research and development in OECD countries comes from universities. So that's why universities particularly try to encourage commercialization and the uh, research and development. Now, the tools of commercialization, we start with intellectual property rights. There are different types of intellectual property rights. The first one is patents, then copyright, industrial design, plan uh, breeders' rights, and I'm going to discuss each one of them later. If you have any questions, just let me know, interrupt. We'll figure out how to fit everything I have to say. Um, then, once we get the intellectual property rights, we need to use them in a way that actually makes sense and um, can make the, uh, the economic growth and can create these innovations. So the way we do this is through the use of licenses. We can do license, license, license agreements, patent pools, cross-licensing, patent clearing houses. We can also create spin-off companies or public-private partnerships or open innovation models. We're going to start now with patents. Now, patents, um, 
are granted over invention. <coughs> and invention is uh, an art um, machine uh, manufacture process product or composition of matter that takes the energy and the matter as it exists in nature and transforms it for the benefit of the humankind. Um, an invention, first of all, has to fall within patentable subject matter. It has to be new, it has to be non-obvious, in, in, and it has to have an industrial application. Now, um, I'm going to leave the patentable subject matter for later because I'm going to talk about exceptions. But for now, I'm going to say that uh, an invention is considered new when um, it's, it results from an inventive and creative activity from the human being. Um, it has to not be uh, in the state of the art. The state of the art is all the cumulative knowledge and technology. Um, so it means basically it can't exist already. It has to be new. It has to be. It has to come from human ingenuity. Um, then non-obvious means that a person skilled in the art doesn't see this as the uh, obvious next step within the field. Now the person skilled in the art is this fictional character that the law creates, and it's just someone who knows his or her field and like for instance I uh, would be a person skilled in the art in law I would not be a person skilled in the art in architecture so um, when we say that it, ha it can be not it, it can be obvious for a person skilled in the art is within that field of knowledge um, then industrial application uh, it has to have uh, a use within the industry. Some people usually confuse patents with copyright and they say for instance that there is a patent on um, dress. If you think about a dress, the dress has no industrial application, it doesn't, it's not being used in the industry. Whereas something that is patentable has to be used in the industry, any industry, but it has to be used in the industry. Um, it also has to, to do whatever the application says it does. If I say that that thermos is going to fly to the moon, for it to be patentable, it has to fly to the moon. If it doesn't, if it only goes to the room across the hallway, then it's not patentable. Um, and then for in some jurisdictions, such as um, uh, the European Union, it can go against the public order or moral morality. And this is basically to prevent things that people may consider against, I don't know, certain religions. But that is why it's not a, a standard requirement because some, most of the jurisdictions try to avoid getting into what the religion would consider patentable. Um, the term for, of protection is 20 years, and this uh, term starts at the date in which a patent application is filed. Um, an important thing here is that patents are not international. Every time that you want a patent in a country, you have to file a patent application and you have to comply with all the requirements of that jurisdiction. The only thing that is considered the most equivalent to a patent, international patent application is the, the uh, PCT, which is uh, all the patent applications that are filed in accordance with the Paris Cooperation Treaty, and that is in Europe. And what this patent application does is you file your patent application in Europe, and you describe all the different countries that you want or that you're thinking about filing an application. So let's say you want to file it in the US, in Canada, Mexico, Brazil, um, the European Union, and Australia. So you have, you, you file your patent application under the PCT, and you start with the US. Let's say you file your application on, on April 1st, but you have, after that you have 12 months to file the, uh, another patent application in any of the countries that you mentioned. And it doesn't matter if you apply it in December 1st 
you still, in Australia, in Australia you would still be considered to have applied on April 1st. So it only gives you a priority in the, in the application, in the filing. And that is important because you don't want someone in Australia saying that they came up with your invention first um, and your 20 years start on, on that day. The rights that a patent gives you are to make you sell or import your invention. Um, this is usually considered a, a negative uh, right because the, the way the legislation is drafted is that you have the exclusive right to exclude others from making, using, selling, or importing. But by definition, if you can exclude others, and then you're the only one who can do it. Um, then there are different types of patents. Um, the, there are patents on products, there are patents on processes and methods, there are patents on um, on composition of matters, and there are patents on improvements. Now, if you think about genetic testing, for instance, you get a patent on the genetic test kit. You can get a patent on a um, um, diagnostic test. You can get a patent on the drug. Uh, if you think about, um, for instance, the same genetic test, you can also get a patent on the process which would mean all the different steps that you describe as necessary to get to that diagnosis. So you start with, uh, I have to put the sample in this little plague, I have to look at it from this perspective using this instrument, um, then you have to determine what's the possible uh, interpretation of the results and how you're going to come up with the, the return of results. So. In, if you think about the genetic testing, you can have a patent on the product, which is a kit. You can have a patent on the process, which is describing what is it that you needed to do. And then you can also, especially in genetic testing, you can also have a patent on the composition of matter. The composition of matter in the genetic test would be, for instance, maybe the, the gene sequence when it's, well, we're going to get to that. but. When, you, when it's isolated, when this genetic sequence is patentable, um, recently in 2013 the U.S. Uh, Supreme Court decided that they are not patentable, the, the genetic sequences, as they exist in, na in nature, even when they are isolated. But the cDNA is patentable, so in this case the cDNA would be a composition of matter. If you think about drugs, the active ingredient would be the patent on the composition matter. So if we go back to all the different types of patents so far, for a drug you could have a patent on the product, which would be the drug itself, how it is presented to the public. Uh, you could have a patent in the composition of matter, that would be the active ingredient. And then the last type of patents is on the improvements. So for instance, if you think about um, Advil, that is not only used for uh, headaches but also used for uh, cold, then you have an improvement in your drug, you have an improvement therefore on your on what you can patent. Regarding the exceptions, so if we go back to the first requirement which was that the invention has to fall within the patentable subject matter, if it's an art composition of matter, manufacture, machine, process that comes from a uh, creative or inventive activity from a human being, um, this requires that the invention is actually created, that it's not just discovered. So what would, co what would constitute an exception would be the natural phenomenon, it would be scientific principles, it would be uh, abstracts and theorems, it would be um, biological processes for the uh, production, reproduction, and propagation of plants and animals. Um, it would be discoveries uh, of something that already exists, even though you don't know it. Uh, it would also be uh, biological and genetic material as, as it exists in nature. Now, if you think about all these examples of exceptions that I just gave you, none of them actually require that uh, ingenuity, that human ingenuity. It's just there and the, the, 
this was one of the reasons for which they, the U.S. Supreme Court decided that gene patents are that genes are not patentable, and it's because yes, no one knew that the BRCA1 and 2 was associated to breast cancer and cervical cancer. So that was an amazing discovery, but it was a discovery, and the they decided this because originally the the criteria was that genes were isolated, they were taken out of the human body and when they were isolated they were caught in those sequences and so the chemical compositions of those little extremes of this gene sequence change. However, the, the, the important part that was necessary to, deter, to determine whether someone had that predisposition was within the other, the, the, the middle of that gene sequence and that Myriad didn't do anything to it. So that is not considered as requiring the human ingenuity. Um, then the second batch of uh, exceptions is schemes, plans, and business methods, uh, computer programs, except in the US. In the US, computer programs are actually patentable, but everywhere else they are not. And the reason for this is that, uh, and this ties to the next exception, which is any other material that is protected but by another type of intellectual property cannot be patentable. So because computer programs are protected by copyright, they can't be patentable. There was a case in Canada about um, Lego, those little horrible pieces that you step on them and <laughs> you damn the world. Um, they had a trademark on the design of the Lego block and they had a trademark on how they looked and the design and they had an industrial design but then because uh, they also had a patent so but that was a patent on the block itself and when the patent expired then uh, Lego tried to to claim that no one else especially mega blocks could not replicate that same design and they say they can't do it because I have a trademark and the trademark we'll see it has a term of protection of 10 years but they are renewable so when the patent expired they wanted to prevent mega blocks from getting into the competition claiming that now they had trademark and that's when the court said no 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 your patent expired they can't use the mark or the, the design Lego but they can replicate or they can have something similar to your little block. Um, then um, also you can't uh, patent surgical and therapeutic um, methods. In some jurisdictions such as Europe and Mexico, it's also the diagnostic methods that you can patent. <coughs> and the purpose of this is because you don't want your doctor trying to determine like whether he can cut into your belly and find something and say, oh no, I may be infringing a patent. So the idea is to put um, health and medical, surgical, therapeutic methods out of that uh, restriction. Um, then the diagnostic methods, however, in, in these jurisdictions that exclude them from patentability, they say that it's only excluded if you do the diagnostic test inside the body. So if I want to determine whether you have, I don't know, mm, flu, but just looking at like something inside your mouth, then that's not patentable. But if I take a sample with a swab from your mouth and then I put it in the microscope and I look at it, then that is patentable. It's just a way of arbitrary circumvention, but that's how it is and that's why gene testing is also <coughs> patentable. Um, then we go to users' rights. and Users' rights um, are, the, the purpose of them is to um, balance the interests of all the parties involved in, in patents. They also try to limit the control that is granted to the to the patent holder and to promote to make sure that innovation is promoted and that healthcare is ensured. Uh, so some of these uh, user rights are uh, for experiments and research. Um, this is this is in in the side of promoting innovation. Um, 
However, the, the concept of research is very vague and it varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So for instance, in Canada, you can say that um, um, you are using in your lab something that is just for your research and that will be fine. But if you go to the US, uh, research in May, uh, done by a university, there was this case in Duke University when they said that the researchers in the university were doing just research and therefore they were not infringing any patents and the Supreme Court said actually yes you're doing research but you're making a profit out of this research research even though you're not commercializing even though you're not selling whatever um, translated product that you're, you you're not even making a product that is marketable yet you're still profiting because your university can charge all those super high tuition fees based on how amazing the researchers are. So when you charge $42,000 $42, a year, is because you have um, a bunch of like high profile researchers infringing on someone else's patents. Therefore, you are not eligible for that user right. So um, even though research and experiments are usually considered an exception to patent infringement, depending on the jurisdiction, it, you have to make sure that you're on the safe side. Um, another user right would be the genetics uh, manufacturers. And in this case, the purpose is to avoid extending the patent term of protection. If we go back to the 20 years, um, when once you, your 20 years expire, then anyone, including the generics manufacturers, can come to your, or can look at what your technology and use your technology to create a, a generic product. Um, however, these generic products, for them to be marketable, you need an approval for, from, the, from the health um, governmental agency. And for that, you need to spend some time. So therefore, if it can take two or three more years, then the patent um, actually extended to 23 years as opposed to 20. So that's why the legislation decided to, to put this exception and say, well, your patent is supposed to expire in two or three years. So you manufacturer, you can come and start doing your approval processes. So once the patent expires in, in the 20 years, you can start marketing your uh, generic product on the first day after those 20 years. Um, the last user exception is compulsory licenses. And this has to do with, uh, on the one hand, if a patent holder refuses to license or to use their invention, and this is in detriment to their further innovation, then the government can uh, file or the, the the competitor can file a, pa a compulsory license and ask the government to force the patent holder to give this, this license and allow the, the use of the invention. This is particularly useful in uh, healthcare issues. Um, an example was in, um, with the AIDS uh, epidemic in, Af in Rwanda, well, all Africa, but particularly in Rwanda, the, the people in Rwanda didn't have access to the, the retroviral. So what they did is they, have had, they filed for a compulsory license. Uh, in, this was before the World Intellectual Property Organization. And they asked um, the manufacturers in Canada to give them the, the, the medication. Uh, originally, no one known of the the pharmaceuticals wanted to do this, but because of the compulsory license, they were forced to actually give them. If you if you remember the type of rights that the patent grants you are to make, use, sell, or import. And with this, if you even say no to that, if you have a compulsory license, then you're forced to import those medications because there is a, a healthcare uh, crisis. Um, then we we do need to register patents. So we do this at the Canadian Intellectual Property Office. Each country has its office. Um, and then the, the, the application has a disclosure which uh, has the purpose of advancing 
the state of the art, all the knowledge or the technology. So you describe in that disclosure as a patent applicant, you need to describe how your invention works. <coughs> if it's a genetic testing, all the different steps, all, all the different instruments that you're going to need, all the different compositional matters or a active ingredients, and how you're supposed to do this. And the idea is that a person skilled in the art is going to be able to replicate your invention whenever, just by looking at your disclosure. Then the claims are um, little, or sometimes not so little, uh, sentences that describe the extent to which you're claiming your property are. So they, they're gonna, I'm gonna show you some of them. So for instance, this is a patent on an adapter for connecting an accessory to a portable electronic device. And then it tells you it includes the first connector. So it has like a very technical description of what the invention is. And then it includes drawings in case you need you are more visual and so it describes like what goes there and what goes here and then the different um, circuits. Um, this is another one for uh, the touch screen. So you see all the different circuits there and in theory this is supposed to tell you what exactly it is but we're not persons skilled in the art. Um, and then how it's going to look like and then each number connects to whatever description is. This is an interesting patent also. So when you buy your Starbucks or your second cup, your Tim Hortons, if you don't want to get burned, you have this little thing, yeah? And that is patentable because it's made of, it has an industrial application. It didn't exist before. The industrial application is you don't get burned. Um, <laughs> the design is like all that <coughs> little kind of like swirling thing. And the material is also very important. If it's metal, then you're gonna get burnt. So the best way to go is cardboard. So all these little things are, are supposed to, to be patentable because they comply with those requirements. And it's actually pretty useful if you think about it, unless you're wearing gloves. Um, so, okay, so we're done with patents. Any I have a question about research. So it doesn't matter if the research is done at the private or public university or a company affiliated with the, an academic institution or a private unaffiliated company. That's the same. In Canada, you could, you could argue that you're doing research. And in the U.S., even if it's a public university, if you are somehow, like for instance, if you get grants, and you're not charging anything to the students, you're still getting grants. Therefore, the, the authority may consider that as profit. So it's kind of like subject to interpretation. I, I would say that in Canada, you're... you're so where is the boundary between replicating somebody's research for the purposes of verification, for example, or advancing science further? versus you know, using somebody's te experimental technique, for example. If you're just verifying, then you're not really making anything. You're just looking at it, you're just trying to understand it, you're trying to learn it. But if you're gonna transform that, that you, that you, um, that you learn into something that you're gonna be able to commercialize later, then that is that could be considered um, but if the patent. purpose is not commercialization then it's fine yeah and like for instance there is this uh, little horrible trick that some companies use that is the the submarine patents that they just lay low until they know that you're actually going to commercialize um this is related to to um to copyright but it has a, a similar thing um my son when he was seven he, well, he started this idea of making a, a website and he was gonna um, design t-shirts. And so he created a t-shirt with Pac-Man and he designed it and he put a trademark with a slogan that was very catchy using the word Pac-Man. And he asked me, mom, can I, what do you think about my t-shirt? And I said, that's copyright and, and trademark infringement. <laughs> and he looked at me like, but I didn't copy it. And, and this is all me. And I said, well, yeah, but, you know, Pac-Man is, is a very well-known character. And um, he said, but it's old. Well, yeah, but... So we, 
long story short, I said, if you, if you sell your t-shirt, if you sell it to me, it would be fine. If you put it in your website, and suddenly you have a lineup of people trying to get your t-shirt, then Pac-Man is probably going to come back after you. So, like, in, in research, as long as you keep it to yourself, then it's, you can always argue that it's, it's the research exception. If you start commercializing, which is the main motive for companies to file for patent infringement, then you're going to be in trouble. And Okay, any other question about patents? Perfect, so now we're going to copyright. So copyright is the type of protect, is, is the protection that is granted on literary, artistic, dramatic, and musical works. Uh, it also applies to computer programs. Literary works, it's um, books, articles, anything that is written. And this is why computer programs are also uh, protected by, by copyright. And it's because if you think about the source code, it's all about just instructions. It's a set of instructions using a language that is about to be used or is supposed to be used in a computer to, do, to, to bring, a, bring about a certain result. So computer programs are considered the equivalent to, um, to literary works. Then artistic, it would be uh, photographs, sculptures, engravings, um, paintings. Dramatic would be choreographies, uh, plays, movies, performances, uh, and musical works. Well, you have. I also I, th I think we had someone from the faculty of music, so it would be the the partitures, the all the lyrics, all the music, all the different. Um, ways in which you use your music instrument. Um, the, the work, in order to be copyrightable, it has to be original. And this is the main distinction between copyright and patents. Patents protect the idea, whereas copyright protect the expression of the idea. And this was the basis for the open source community and the free software community to be against patent, uh, patents on, on on computer programs, and it's because if you if you create, let's say, a story about um, this super adventurous um, magician that goes through different magic worlds fighting all the demons, you get the idea that it's Harry Potter. But if you put there a lot or enough differences, then your work is also patentable. If you think about all the boring Disney movies about princesses, it's basically the same plot <laughs> to just change the color of the princess and <laughs> the adventure to get kissed by the prince at the end. Um, but it's the expression of the idea that is copyrightable, whereas patents is just it's the idea per se. Um, so the originality in copyright, there was a discussion about whether it could be just the sweat of the brow, which was a UK approach, which was even if you're copying, you're actually putting a lot of work on it, so therefore you should be entitled to copyright. But then Canada said, no, 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 it's skill and judgment. So you have to, uh, to bring out something that is not the same as the other one. It, can, it doesn't have to be crea like creative, like like the standard of patents. It just has to be skill and judgmental different from the rest. Um, it has to come from a from a human being, and this was uh, also a case where uh, Peter wanted to um, the government or um, the world to recognize copyright on gorillas self-portraits or elephant self-portraits. So they had a gorilla drawing himself like a selfie and they had also elephants and they were saying that the, the work was new, the, it was original and therefore it needed to be copyrighted and the, the, the copyright um, office said well yeah but it's an elephant and it's it's a gorilla, 
it doesn't come from a human being, so therefore it's not copyrightable. Um, no one, like any, anyone can just copy the gorilla selfie and sell it, and no one, everyone can profit from that. Um, and then, because it protects the expression of the idea, it has to be fixed in a material form. I can't just say, oh, you, I actually thought about Harry Potter before you did. So you are copyright infringing my idea. So it, in this case, it, it can be like that. It has to be expressed. Um, for if, if, I don't know, my sister and I are doing, or twin and I are, are doing the same research. And, and if I don't put it in a computer, then I can't claim, claim copyright. It has to be somehow fixed in a material form for you to be copyrightable. Um, yeah. But if you just record it uh, in your computer and you don't share it for some outlet or... It's still, it's still copyrightable. As, as soon as you put it in a material uh, support, it doesn't matter if you, if you publish it or not. As just, it has to be there. Um, in this case, the protection, the term of protection is 50 years in Canada. Uh, it's a life of the author plus 50 years. Um, in the US, thanks to Mickey Mouse, it's 70 years. And in Mexico, it's 100 years. So if you think about the happy birthday song, um, up to, I think it was two or three years ago, everyone singing happy birthday in the park was copyright infringing that song. <laughs> uh, that's why I told my son he was infringing Pac-Man because the author of Pac-Man is still alive. Um, and that's why, for instance, the Little Prince is now in the public domain in Canada, but not in Mexico. So in Mexico, no one else can um, publish the Little Prince or any adaptation to the to Little Prince. In this case, copyright doesn't require any registration. So in your case, as soon as you put it in your computer, as soon as you type something, you record it, whatever, you get copyright protection from that day. However, people usually register it to be able to prove that you did it before I did. So if you go to the, to the Canadian Intellectual Property Office and you register um, a poem, that you wrote, and I you, you registered on um, April 1st, and then I come on May 15, and I say, oh no, I thought about it first, but I don't have the proof, then you get the copyright and not me. Um, there are two types of rights here. There are the moral rights and the patrimonial rights. Moral rights are the right to be associated to your work, the right to be uh, attributed as an author and the right to prevent others from modifying your work. So it's called the integrity right. If you remember, I hope there are no Trump supporters here, but if you remember the horrible person when he was um, appointed as a, as a candidate when he won the primaries, he came out with the Queen song of We Are the Champions. Mm -hmm. And the Queen actually expressed openly how that was copyright infringement because they didn't want to be associated with Trump. So that's part of the moral rights. And then the patrimonial rights are the right to first distribute the work, the right to, um, to produce, to reproduce, to translate, to adapt, to sell, um, and to <coughs> import the, your, your copyrighted uh, work. Um, they are called patrimonial because usually you get uh, compensation, any royalty for uh, the license to, to do it. And then we have the fair dealing or fair use, which is equivalent to the exception rights. Um, the fair dealing is a concept in Canada, the fair use is in the US. And basically, the, um, the fair dealing are the fair dealing states certain specific cases where you're considered to not be copyright infringing. And these are research, private study, teaching, um, criticism, parody, satire, uh, review, and news reporting. So later I'm going to show you a video and we're being recorded. So I could be concerned about using that video and therefore copyright infringing. However, I'm going to claim 
that is fair dealing because I'm just teaching and we're discussing the video and I'm not getting any profit out of it. Um, so this deals with the, with this takes us to the the um, requirements for uh, uh, use of a copyrighted work to be considered fair dealing. And this is first of all you have to mention the source of um, that that you're using. You have to take just a reasonable amount. Um, it can't affect the commercialization of the work. And in Canada, you can also you also have to say that you had no other alter uh, alternatives. So, um, for instance, in, in Mexico, my horrible president, uh, he claimed that he is a lawyer, and he they found finally his his uh, his undergrad thesis, and it turned out that he had one third of the of the thesis is taken from three different authors that he didn't even mention in in his bibliography. So like, yes, it's not the whole thesis, but it's one third of the thesis. He didn't even mention the source, and okay, he didn't profit from that, because I don't even believe he's a lawyer, but he he actually got to the presidency. And and even though he tried to to put it down as Oh, it was just a mistake of I forgot to name my sources. That's an, an obvious case of copyright infringement. So these are examples. So this little drawing is is just a, an artistic work. You have here the music. You have this awesome dancing bear from the Inuit culture, and we have the apple. Um, as I'm going to explain later, you also you will also have um, a trademark over this, and you would have also a trademark over this. But as drawings, they each have its uh, its copyright protection. I have yes. a question with regards to music mm -hmm. because I feel like increasingly um, artists are being taken to court about these things. Um, is there is there a specific regulation that really details? what would be considered similar melody or similar tunes to, to something else? There is no bullet list of requirements. Okay. Um, it all depends, and this also has to do with trademarks, it all depends on whether someone can be tricked into thinking that that is very similar. And that's why usually these cases are, they have to be settled in court, because the judge has to look at like what what's really happening. If you think about that um, Blur Lines and Marvin Gaye, um, I do remember that when I, when I first heard the Blur Lines song, I was like, oh yeah, Marvin Gaye. And I'm like, wait, no, this is not it. So like the similarity is striking. Whereas I actually saw the other day that Radiohead was accused of, of copyright infringing. And I clicked on it and I'm like, don't see it, but it was considered copyright infringement. So it all depends on how the judge decides. Okay. Um, this, you see the paper. Here you have the, all the different logos and the design. And um, here you have the source code and the object code of the software. So are we okay with copyright? Okay. So now we go to industrial design. Um, okay. So now the industrial design is uh, it's a visual, what is protected is a visual design of an object's non purely utilitarian features. And the features are of shape, configuration, pattern, or ornament. Um, an example would be the, the Coca Cola bottle. The bottle, the, the way it's shaped, it's not really utilitarian. It doesn't really matter if, if it's all curvy or if it's just like a cylinder. It's just something that is, that is, that is uh, specific to the Coca-Cola bottle. So it's a shape and it's just a visual design of the object. The requirements are that it has to be original, meaning it can be a, repli a replicate of something else, it has to be new, and it has to be not contrary to morality. So if you think about um, the Jean Paul Gaultier per perfume bottles, uh, some of them have the shape of a woman. 
However, it's not the naked woman, it's a woman with a corset, because some people would consider seeing an evil against morality. So it's still subject to interpretation, but the idea is to avoid anything that would offend the delicate minds of some. Um, the registration is required, and the protection is 10 years. In Mexico, it's 15 years. You see a lot of like, comparison to Mexico for obvious reasons. Um, the rights that you are granted are to make, sell, rent, offer, or import your design. Um, for in some jurisdictions, you have the sweet generous protection of industrial design, like in Mexico. In the states, you have that industrial designs are protected by a design patent, and in some others, it's it's uh, protected as a trademark or distinguishing guys. Um, so this would be the industrial design. If you think about the iPhone, it's very different from an LG or uh, what is it, Pixel or a Nexus. It's like it's just how it is. Uh, if we go back to the examples of patents that I gave you, um, Apple would have a patent on the the touch screen, on the button, on the circuit. It would also have. Um, uh, copyright on the drawing, it would have a copyright on the apple, and then it would have an industrial design on how it looks. Like if you if you think about the iPhone, it doesn't really matter how big or small it is, so it's not utilitarian, it's just stylish. And if you think about the Apple Watch, it's the same thing. It's just how it looks all pretty. But couldn't you argue that the su that the size is actually utilitarian? Because if it's small, then it's capable of fitting into your pocket, capable of being carried places. Whereas if it's bigger, like you imagine you, you can you can get a bigger pocket. <laughs> <laughs> so like you could argue it, but at the end of the day, it's not really utilitarian. It doesn't really make a difference. Okay. Um, so then, plant variety rights, and um, so these rights are granted to plant uh, vari varieties that are new, distinct, uniform, and stable. New means that it hasn't been commercialized within the, the latest 12 months. It has to be distinct, which means that um, the shape, the maturity, the height has to be different um, from all existing plants. It has to be uniform, which means that those characteristics uh, that are distinct are actually the same from plant to plant within the same variety and then it has to be stable which means that the, those, those uh, characteristics have to be transferred from generation to generation of the plant. I'm going to show you later some uh, examples. Uh, the protection is for 20 years um, and 25 for trees and vines. It's also national registration so you have to get in any any uh, any country, you have to get the, the registration. And it's over the propagating material and over the harvested material. So it would be on the, over the seeds, cutting divisions, tissue cultures, and it would also be on the flowers and the fruits. So these are the examples. Here you see, like, for a non-trained like me, it would be the same plan, but it actually kind of looks different in how the, the little branch goes up and the flowers and here the, even the concentration of the flowers is different so this would be considered a different plant and every plant so like if you have let's say four flowers they all have to look the same and if you plant the same ones all the other ones that are going to be growing every year they have to look the same for the plant variety to be considered stable what happens when uh, people crossbreed then? Are, is the final product from that also patentable? You would, you could get, no, not patentable, but you like would you get, get this. Some rights because if you remember, an exception was you can patent something that is protected by something else. So in this case, it would be the plant variety, mm -hmm. where in the jurisdictions that it actually exists, and you would be protected because of your, like in Mexico, we have this, I hate papaya. But they somehow they created a papaya that is crossed with something that I don't even know how you call it in English, but it's called mamey. 
So it's sweeter. So it looks like a papaya. However, it's smaller and sweeter. So that would be considered protected by plant variety breeders. And if somebody takes that uh, crossbred variety and mix it with something else, and with coconut, them, they can also <laughs> cut. But as we will see in all the concerns, sometimes when you have overlapping rights, it's going to be a complication on who owns what. Um, so now we go to trade secrets. Now trade secrets. I have a question yeah. about copyright. Uh, I, I'm thinking about the, the local apple mark um, because the apple everyone can grow an apple. So I'm just wondering why it's protected by copyright. It's it, it actually it's and I'm I'm going to mention it in, in trades in trademarks. But if you think about that apple, yes, I can I can draw an apple. Let's say. Um, Let's, let's pretend that I'm, I'm drawing an apple. I would do it like this. And then maybe I'll do the, the, the little bite like that. Like this, even though I'm trying to replicate from memory the apple from apple, it's actually different. They, and this is where the trademark actually, the infringement and the whole business comes from. They're, they have actually tried to prevent people from drawing apples. But like this is obviously not coming from Apple. If I sell you a watch with this, <laughs> no. um, OK, so now trade secrets. Trade secrets are not really a form of intellectual property, but they are related. So uh, trade secret is um, information that um, is, has an economic value and that has been uh, uh, kept confidential for the purpose of giving the owner a competitive advantage. If you think about um, Coca-Cola and the recipe, they haven't, the, the only protection that the recipe has is that it's a trade secret. No one knows what it is and actually if you, if you drink coke like I do, you can detect a coke from Mexico, a coke from the US, a coke from Canada. Like the recipe is different, but no one knows what it is. So they have been, that's information that has an economic value because it's obviously different from Pepsi. And it has been kept secret and to maintain this competitive advantage. Now the type of information that, we, that would be considered trade secrets would be um, uh, know-how, patterns, designs, formulas, uh, data, compilation of information. So anything that you can think of and you say it's secret, even gossip, as long as it has uh, an economic value, then it will be considered uh, trade secret. The way it is protected is through confidentiality agreements and these are used basically to determine the extent of what is considered confidential and the penalties in case you disclose the confidential information. Now, the benefits are, first of all, everything can be considered trade secret as opposed to patents that only patentable subject matter that is new, non-obvious, has uh, an industrial application or copyright that is new or regional and fixed. In this case, everything can be protected by trade secrets. Um, there is no registration, therefore you don't have to invest in getting registration. By the way, patents are up to somewhere between $3,000 and $10,000 per application. Um, you also don't have an expiration date. You can maintain your Coca-Cola formula secret for as long as you want. However, the problem is, first of all, Yes, you can consider, you can even apply penalties that are very painful. However, once the secret is out, there is no way to go back. Like, it's not considered trade secret anymore. So that's one disadvantage. The other one is that if you are in an environment that you're trying to promote cumulative <coughs> innovation, if you keep information secret, then no one else can uh, innovate on that or can uh, find any flaws, like I don't know if I'm dying because of the coke, 
because no one has ever done any testing on whether the formula has poison. <laughs> Probably not. Um, and uh, so, uh, and yeah, so it's, it's, as I said, it's, it's short term because once you, you put it out there, then there is, there is no 20 years as, as in the patent or the life of the author, author plus 50 years as in copyright. Everything is just like destroyed as a secret. Um, any question about trade secrets? No? Okay. So now we go to trademarks. Now, trademarks is a type of protection that is uh, granted on design, design or expression that identifies a product as originating from uh, a specific commercial source. So we go back to your question about the apple. Um, in that case, if I see the, the apple that I drew, I know that it doesn't come from that apple. Um, how, but a trademark, that's the whole purpose of it. That you see the logo, you see the sign, and you know that it comes from Apple, or you know that it comes from Starbucks. Even if you think about the second cup, if, unless you see the little green siren, you don't think that it comes from Starbucks. Um, in this case, the protection is for 10 years and it's renewable, so basically it lasts forever, as long as you remember to do it. Um, the requirements are that the sign design or expression has to be new, meaning you can't copy it from something else. It has to be distinctive, um, which basically means that it is special. If you think about the apple, well, the apple is not a special, but the way the apple is designed is a special. Um, it, it can be descriptive. So if I say um, Italian coffee as a trademark, and it's Italian coffee, it's, it's descriptive. Uh, there was a trademark that I was um, trying to ban, well, to, to nullify in the U.S. because it was spicy sauce for snacks in Spanish. And it was completely descriptive because it was spicy sauce for snacks. Um, so you can have a design that is descriptive. Uh, it can be deceptive. That Italian coffee trademark that I mentioned before, it's actually a trademark in Mexico for Mexican coffee. So it was deceptive. We were able to argue our way out, but it said that it was Italian and it wasn't, so it can be deceptive. And it has to be used or with the intention to use. So if for some reason Apple stops using the, the Apple for the watch, then in a certain number of years, I think it was like 10 years, you can't, uh, they can't hold trademark anymore. It has to be continuously used. Um, our, our with the intention, because sometimes the companies try to, to get a path, uh, trademark um, registration for a business in the future. Uh, so they can do that, they have three years after they get the registration to be able to actually use it, but it has to be used. The whole purpose of this is to avoid, especially because the trademark is an expression and it's usually with words, they try to avoid taking words from any language and just making them private or of exclusive use. Um, you can, in, in Canada and the US in common law countries, you, even though it would be good to have a, a patent registration, you can also have common law, uh, I mean, sorry, trademark. A trademark registration, you can also have a passing off or common law uh, trademark. And this means basically you've been using your trademark for X amount of years, Therefore, you are considered to be the owner of that uh, sign, design, or expression. So does, does, a, does a, a Apple logo protect by both trademark and copyright? Is that what you mean? No. The, the Apple logo is only protected by trademark, but the logo as a drawing is protected by copyright. And then Apple has patents on all of its uh, products. And, and different aspects and instruments of their products. 
I had a question. Is there any type of protection for websites? Let's say I I purchase a website address which is www.starbucks.whatever mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, Starbucks is a registered... Uh, In that case, uh, it's called the... It actually... There is a, an agency before the World Intellectual Property Organization and it's called the Domain Names uh, Dispu uh, Dis Dispute Office. And uh, in that case, it's not considered a type of protection isolated, it's considered part of trademarks. Okay. So, for instance, um, I had a client in Mexico, and my client was International Hotels Group, and they had the, someone else had registered IHG.com. And so I had to get their, their domain name based on trademark. Um, there was this other client, a uh, cinema company called Cinepolis, and um, they, uh, we actually had to go to fight for his domain name before the WIPO, and it took us five years to actually get the domain name back. And all the whole um, lawsuit was based on trademark, and it was trademark infringement because at the end of the day, when you go to the website and you type in cinepolis.com, you you expect that website to be originating or associated to the type of products and services that are provided by this company. So it is just an extension, a, let's say, a cyber extension of trademarks. Another question? Yeah. Okay, so these are examples. You have an example, um, this is like, you see this as, and, and you may think about that little nail thing that you use to play guitar, but actually is a trademark for nightclub. <laughs> and the way you can get trademarks is not only this as iPhone as all together. You can get a trademark over the Apple, you can get a trademark over iPhone, you can get a trademark with the Apple and the iPhone, you can get a trademark on the Apple, the iPhone with colors. Um, and uh, here you see that you have to provide the list of articles or products and services that you're going to use the trademark for. So in this case, well, uh, this is a description. The apples, open fruit slices, over quarters of a fruit, one fruit, other leaves, style, stylized leaves, and one leaf. So that's the description of this apple. Um, here, the description with the s Starbucks is the siren, crowns, open at the top, one crown, stars, and then they actually describe the, the color. Um, there is a trademark on the Tiffany color. The Tiffany, if you, if you remember the, the jewelry company, they have a trademark on their blue, and it's called the Tiffany blue. And the way they registered it was describing what shades of blue with another green and white and all the combinations. So, but in that case, the Tiffany blue can only be used as a trademark for jewelry. If I wear it as a shirt, I'm not infringing because it's not used for shirts. There is also a trademark on the Harley Davidson sound. So, and, and, and it is very funny, but at the same time you hear the sound and you know it's a Harley Davidson. <laughs> so, like, it, it kind of fulfills the purpose of the trademark. There are also trademarks on smells. So, Okay, so th those are the, uh, the examples. So if you wanted to see if there's a trademark that already exists for an idea that you have, where mm -hmm. would you go and like search for those? You go to the Canadian Intellectual Property Office. Mm -hmm. um, they have usually, and um, like every uh, ha uh, intellectual property office in the world, most of them have a um, um, like database. So you would, you would type in, let's say, um, Apple, and you would get all the trademarks that have or or are mentioned with an Apple. Um, some of these uh, databases are free, like Canada and the U.S. In Mexico, some of them are free, some others are uh, paid. You even have people that you can file a petition, and so you you 
you filed your, your petition saying, I'm looking for any trademark that includes an apple. In that case, someone is going to go through their databases and even the logos. Because if you think about the apple, well, maybe you were missing a design that actually contains an apple. But in this case, there are people, in theory, more thorough, going through all the designs that they have in the database, and then they will tell you, oh, you may be conflicting with this and this and this other. Um, any other question? No? Okay. What time is it? Um, so now I'm going to talk about the McGill policy on IP. Uh, if you have any question specific to you, you can go to this uh, link. Um, the way the McGill policy is drafted is, first of all, there is a technology transfer office. It's the Office of Sponsored Research. And what they do is they give any information uh, to any of the McGill community. And they can, they can help you out whether your invention or your work is actually commercialized, uh, commercializable. They can help you with any business plan. They can help you with even finding whether you could have a partner. They can help you to uh, get spin-off companies. Actually, McGill and this uh, office have currently around 55 spin-off companies that have created with inventions uh, of the McGill community. Um, so it, it, the, the policy is described or is divided into types for students and for academic, administrative, and support staff. So in the case of students, um, the copyright or anything, it's, it's uh, as long as it doesn't require the assistance of McGill for them to develop the invention. And as long as they are not co-authors or co-inventors, all the students own their intellectual property. Alone, not McGill. But if you use McGill, or if you, if you let's say, you work in a lab and you have your, your supervisor working with you, then you, and that supervisor is considered staff, then you, the, the, the intellectual property is gonna be different. But if it's only you, like for instance, your thesis, uh, it's it's the, all, anything intellectual property related to, to your thesis is just yours. Um, if you and this applies to undergrads and postgraduate students, then for the staff, academic, administrative, or support staff, they have different uh, categories. So, for instance, for copyright, the copyright is owned by the staff member. Um, however, if the staff uh, uses the assistance of the of the um, university if they they use the equipment or the facilities of McGill, uh, or if it's part of their academic duties or work, then they have to grant the university a non-exclusive, royalty-free, irrevocable, and indivisible, not transferable license. Um, then for patents is a, it's something similar so if the staff uh, is um, requires assistance of McGill or if they, um, they the invention is created as part of their uh, academic duties or work or if they use the university's equipment uh, infrastructure or resources, then the patent is jointly owned by the inventor and by McGill. The same happens with uh, computer software, and this is this is this is separated from copyright and from patents because there apparently there is this software called Learnware, and they have been developing this uh, this tool, and so they want to have a specific intellectual property over that. Um, however, if the invention or the computer software is created as part of the employment contract, then the intellectual property belongs to McGill. Another thing is like there is no obligation to commercialize. So even if you even if you're staff and you created something and you say, you know what, I don't 
I want my computer to be uh, distributed royalty free, open source, in accordance with this uh, non profitable um, strategies, then you don't have an obligation to commercialize. Um, so now we, how do we use, once we get all the intellectual property, how do we use it? How do we actually make a profit out of it? And the way we make a profit is besides um, getting damages from uh, lawsuits, mm -hmm. um, you get, you, you can use uh, or grant licenses. And there are this type of licenses. The most simple one is the uh, just regular license agreement, in which case <coughs> the patent holder or the copyright holder grants someone else, any third party, the authorization to make or to use or to sell or to translate whatever their, their patentable or their copyrighted work. Um, usually you can do it uh, exclusive or non-exclusive. You can do it for a fee or royalty free. You can do it transferable or non-transferable. And that's the, the most simple one. Then you have the cross licensing, which would mean that uh, two uh, patent holders or copyright holders, they decide, they negotiate that they are gonna grant each other a, a, a license to make, to use, to sell, to import. Um, and then we have these two types, which are a little bit more complex. The patent pools, if you think about a pool, like, like a regular pool, you have, like, if you bring all of your floaties, you put them all together in the pool, and you, you can just jump in and get whatever floaty you want. In this case, a patent pool is, instead of floaties, you bring your patents. And the most, um, the most common one is the, the patent pool for the DVD technology. And in this case, there were nine companies that, bring, that brought on all of their, of their patents on anything DVD technology. So they, were, they had patents on the, on the storage device. They had patents on the device that was playing. And they had patents on the read, readable device. And so they, they all brought around 15 patents to the patent pool. And they, they grant these licenses for the patents as a package. So if you want, if anyone that wanted to, and this is usually, um, it's commonly used for, to, to develop a standard. So if you think about the DVDs, all, the, all these companies and everyone else that wanted to develop on the DVD technology, they wanted their DVDs to be viewable everywhere in the world by any device. So for them to be able to do this, they had to develop a standard. And this standard was actually rich because all the patent holders were able to grant licenses to, to each other or to any third party that wanted to participate in the innovation. And that is a little bit different from a patent clearinghouse because the patent clearinghouse is just a collecting agency that puts together providers and, and intellectual property holders who are looking to develop or to use uh, in, an intellectual property or an, a technology. Um, then we have spin-off companies uh, that are companies that are separated from a, a company or a, an organization and it's it becomes autonomous and independent from the parent company and they 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 are assigned employees staff um, resources technology intellectual property and products and they just specialize in commercializing then we have public private partnerships which are um, members of the public and the private sector who come together as partners to share their risk and responsibilities as well as their expertise and their resources um, in order to develop or to, to develop a technology and that way to avoid any duplication. Um, the problem with the public-private partnerships is that 
if you if you put together members from the public and the private sector, they usually have goals that are different. They have expectations that are some sometimes contradictory. Um, so it's very important to be able to to work through all these differences in the beginning. Um, and then we have the open innovation models. The open innovation model is a model of collaboration in which um, there is a collaboration of internal and external parties to the company with uh, their resources. They, they contribute their resources, their expertise, and, and their ideas, their strategies. And the difference, the specific difference with the open innovation model as opposed to the open source is that in addition to trying to make the innovation process um, more efficient and effective and faster, they are trying also to extend their markets and to uh, maximize their, their profit. So you, you will see that in the open source um, model, usually they're trying just to advance the technology or the innovation. In this case, they're trying also to commercialize. So they, one of their main um, purposes is to be able to, let's say, commercialize uh, in Europe at the same time that they are commercializing in, uh, in America. Um, all of these tools, and that's why they're relevant, is that they use intellectual property. So they take the patents, the copyright, trade secrets, trademarks, and they put them all together and they negotiate among themselves so they can make the, the innovation and the commercialization faster and more profitable. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, do some companies uh, do a license agreement to take the intellectual property and then don't do anything with it because it would compete with what they have? Is that like a method? So you say they, I, I try to get a license from you to prevent you from using it or to prevent her like, from using it? Are there like it? exclusive like licensing agreements or something? Because lots of them are based off royalties, but they're not doing anything with it. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, it's uh, this was actually kind of compared to uh, to the Cold War, but it's usually it's it's, it's a, something similar. And what happens is they they especially spin-off companies they get intellectual property from other companies, and they they don't use it, but they just use it in case. A competitor wants to come in the market, and so then they they threaten with suing using all those patents, especially it's with patents. They they threat to use all the patents to prevent others from coming into the market. If you think about um, Apple and Google, um, Google bought all of uh, I think it was Motorola's intellectual property portfolio. Uh, Apple, uh, Samsung. They, they've been all doing that. However, I mean, Apple still um, uses it, uh, Samsung too, but there are some other companies that that's their business. They just, they just buy uh, someone else's portfolio and they just wait for a competitor to try to use something and then they threat with uh, suing them. Um, I have kind of a, a follow-up question. So let's say uh, I own some intellectual property and uh, I want to license it to somebody, but I also want to make sure that they like, make a reasonable effort to commercialize the thing and not just kind of sit on it. Mm -hmm. um, can I do that in a license agreement? Yeah. Yeah, and the, the beauty of the agreement is that as long as it's not illegal or it's not uh, contrary to morality, you can put whatever you want in an agreement. For instance, an agreement on um, how to deal drugs would not be legal, but if you want to include that, that let's say if your uh, licensee doesn't use your, li your technology within the next three years, you revoke the license. You can totally do that. Um, so now, who encourages commercialization? Um, it's usually the government, and the government does it through legislation. For So, for instance, in the U.S., they, there is a Badal Act that uh, encourages all universities that get public funding to get intellectual property on the inventions that were using that funding. 
Um, also, there is the Proposition 71 in California that prevent, that uh, encourages encourages more like forces all the um, research centers that are using their funding to. In this case, it was something called the Protected Commons, and in this case, um, they have to commercialize and they have to grant royalty um, for a royalty license to anything that is not California and maintaining a royalty-free license for all the research centers within California. So the government does it in different ways, especially legislation. Um, sometimes they merge with as, as funding agencies, so funding agencies can also encourage commercialization by stating that you, when, you're, um, when you're filling out your application, you have to list all the patents that you have or all the publications that you have. Uh, and that would be considered a plus in the final evaluation of your application. Um, they also sometimes also have a, an extra funding uh, um, kind of part um, that, is, that, that is devoted to help you to commercialize. So if uh, the CIHR has a certain funding when, when you are applying that you can apply for that extra funding in case you want to commercialize your invention. Uh, then we have the technology transfer offices of host institutions such as universities and we have governing bodies of companies trying to push uh, inventors to commercialize and to obtain intellectual property rights. Now we're going to go back to the advantages. So first of all we have the maximization of wealth. We Intellectual property is said to, to grant incentives to invest and innovate because when you have that uh, possibility of making a living out of your your creation or your invention then you may feel more encouraged to it as a company if you can recoup your investment you can also feel encouraged to uh, to keep investing and innovating the, the innovation process is supposed to be faster because if you have intellectual property and this relates to the facilitation of in innovation information markets. Um, when, when you have intellectual property and you know that you are the one who holds the patents, then you're not afraid of collaborating with someone else because you know that that someone else is not going to steal your invention, that that someone else is actually going to contribute and it's going to make the, the innovation process faster. Um, so it, it's supposed to make it faster by encouraging and facilitating uh, collaboration. It also allows to share costs of the innovation process. It promotes disclosure. If you remember the patents, how you're supposed to disclose your invention. Um, and copyright, how you have to put it in, um, in a fixed material form. Um, and then it creates a, lar a larger network because once you know that Apple has all those patents, then you know where to go. If you know that Google has patents over the, the Android phone or the operating system, then you know that you can go there and try to collaborate with them. Um, however, as, as I mentioned before, there is this concern about the overlapping uh, intellectual property. And this happens because when you have patents over those little things, if you, if you remember the, the iPhone, there were like little circuits that were only like too tiny for us to understand. However, if that technology is owned by someone and then Apple comes and tries to get now the iPhone and then that iPhone uses technology of Google and then Samsung, then you may have a very dense web of overlapping intellectual property rights. And that's what is considered a patent ticket. When you don't know and you want to know who, know who who owns the technology and you may want to try to go to the uh, intellectual property offices and find out sometimes you don't have the knowledge or the skill to be able to do that. Um, for instance, um, there for the, for the Apple Watch there were over 20 different patents that could be related to that technology. Um, you don't know who owns them, uh, you don't know to what extent the patent covers it. If, even if you read the claims, even if you read the disclosure, you don't know exactly 
when is your invention supposed to, to infringe that technology? So in that case, and, and even if you do, if there are many patent holders, then you have to obtain a license from each one of them. And you have to negotiate the terms. And you may have that clause of you have to do it in three years. And I may have a clause that says you have to do it in one year or in 10 years. Or you don't have to do it. So you have to negotiate all those terms for your license. And you have to pay the royalties. So sometimes inventing in a, in a field or on a product that is, is filled with uh, different patent holders can be discouraging. Uh, some researchers say that they just move away from that product and they start doing something else. Some others say, I'm just a tiny middle-sized company that I don't have the resources to develop on something that is owned by Apple. So this creates the triady of the anti-commons. And the anti-commons means that it's a, there is an underuse of a resource. Um, the concept comes from the tragedy of the commons, in which case you had a common resource that if you don't have uh, certain limitations or um, property owners, then everyone can come and use that common resource. And if everyone can do it and no one holds back, then that resource is going to exhaust super easy. So as a result of that, they, they came up with all oh, that's a justification for property rights. But then when you have too many property rights, then you go to the other extreme, which is the tragedy of the anti-commons. Then nothing is common. And if nothing is common, then there, those resources may be underused. Um, there's also the concern about commodification. And this is particularly true for genes, um, because then knowledge, and in this case, gene sequences, are considered not life, but they're considered just objects. There is a, a concern about the, the threat to academic culture. And in this case, before the, the academic culture was about learning and knowledge that was in the public good, now it's more capitalistic view of, the, of learning. There is also the idea that if you grant incentives to only innovate and invest in uh, profitable products or fields, then the whole idea of, um, of a universal, communal, uh, disinterested, organized skepticism that was the principles of science are lost because it's not about learning anymore, it's not about innovating anymore, it's about what you can profit from. Um, and then there is the idea of secrecy because even though intellectual property is supposed to make this facilitation of information markets easier and to promote and to make the innovation process faster. The truth is when you can only get a patent if you are the first one to invent something, then when you invent something, you don't want to give to tell your neighbor, you don't want to tell your, your lab partner about it because you're afraid that that person is actually going to get a patent before you do. So there is this idea that, and even uh, um, if you talk about your invention in a conference, if you talk about your invention in a paper, um, you can destroy the possibility of patenting because that would be considered as part of the state of the art. So people tend to hold on to their information, to their in, in discoveries or, and, and inventions so as to be able to patent first. So the, that's a concern um, on secrecy. And then so alternatives, and I'm going to go super fast on this. So we have the open science, which um, is based on principles of sharing, um, cumulative innovation, collaboration, and fast dissemination. They try to, to create a commons on, in, on information and knowledge so everyone else can have access to it. Um, a little bit more limited is the open access, and this is just to, uh, so they keep everything here in the public domain. Here in the open access is just a policy of trying to maintain everything just, you know, moving, all the information moving. Um, and then we have the, and the way the open access works is with the protected commons that I mentioned before, in which case you have, um, you maintain access to the information but you maintain a royalty-free uh, terms of licensing 
for certain people, for certain uh, research centers. So in the, in the example of California, you had uh, California uh, and the government granting funds to research centers in California, and they were saying every research center that is part of our funding agency or that receives any of our funds, they have to have free access to the, any innovation that is created through our funds. However, everything that is in Massachusetts or in Canada or in Argentina, you have to provide a uh, um, royalty uh, license based on royalties. We have the open innovation models that I mentioned before, and we have the public-private partnerships. <sighs> so now, the final remarks. Um, first of all, there is not just one correct model. We see all the different types of intellectual property. We see all the different tools that can use intellectual property. Uh, for some people, having a public-private partnership would work better. For some others, it would be an open innovation model. For some others, it would be um, an open science model. Um, the patent pools are also an option. So what we need to understand is, first of all, that researchers have different motivations. Whereas some researchers are only uh, interested in uh, publishing or in um, being named fellow of the Royal Canada Society. Society. <laughs> um, some others actually want to get patents and they want to be hired by Google or they want to be hired by Apple. Um, the industry is also different. If you think about the, the software industry, it's way different from the pharmaceutical or the biotech industry. Um, whereas in the, in the software industry, all you need is a computer and to be and a book on how to, um, <coughs> to program on C or C++. With pharma and biotech, you actually need the infrastructure, you need the labs, you need the people, you need the instruments. Um, so the industry has to be taken into account. Then the goals, what are the goals of, of when, you are in, when you're investing or the goals for when you're innovating? Uh, if you're part of the industry, if you're part of the, a research institution or a university, and what are the pressures and expectations that funding agencies <coughs> can, uh, can bring or the government can bring? Or if you think about the public-private partnerships, um, there are the, the companies may expect to profit, whereas the government may want to make sure that any that anyone in the countries have access to healthcare. So all those expectations have to be taken into account when you decide to commercialize. I, love this I was born with spine bifida, which is a birth defect. Uh, it's basically a hole in the spine where all the nerves don't develop. When I was 10, I got really sick, and they were trying to figure out what was going on. And I was in and out of the hospital every week, and they finally figured out that I was actually in kidney failure. A faulty bladder was Luke's problem, caused by the spina bifida. The bladder was sending fluid back up into my kidneys, which was making them not work correctly. But Luke was given a remarkable treatment. At Wake Forest School of Medicine in America's North Carolina, researchers are growing artificial body parts. Luke was one of the first in the world to benefit. They take a piece of your bladder out, they grow it in a lab for two months into a new bladder that's your own and they, and they put it back in. Grow your own organs in the lab means no rejection problems and no waiting around for organ donors. It's called regenerative medicine and it's an exciting future that awaits us all. I see us getting to a point of having options available that actually stop disease processes, reverse disease processes, or offer people cures. Simple organs, like bladders, are the easiest to grow. Cells were taken from Luke's original bladder, multiplied up, nutrients added, and that produced this pink solution. And we then create a three-dimensional mold, and we place a cell on top of the mold. The mold is in the shape of a bladder and is made from material that breaks down in the body. We place the mold with the cells in an oven-like device. We cooked it, if you will, very much like baking a layer cake. And we then were able to take that organ out and we were able to place it into patients. And the team has cooked up more than bladders. 
Another of the organs that we have targeted is the urethra, which is the channel that connects the bladder to the outside of the body. It is a very important organ, as you can imagine. Some of Anthony's patients had had car accidents, damaging their urethras. So he decided to grow them new ones. They were like bladders, really, with a different geometry. <clears throat> Scaffolding was seeded with the patient's cells and nutrients, and then sewn into the shape of a urethra. And we then were able to place those engineered urethras back into those patients. To automate organ making, the researchers came up with an incredible method. Print them. They even started out with modified computer printers. But instead of using ink, we use cells, and we print the cells with a gel-like material, one layer at a time, and we then allow the gel to get harder over time. Nowadays, these bio-printers are purpose-built and much more sophisticated. Indeed, on the other side of the country, in San Diego, we visited startup company Organovo. They're planning to take bio-printing to market. Very impressive-looking labs. Brand new. Brand new. Been here for about three weeks. This is where the action happens. These are our tissue culture heads. It keeps everything sterile. And when we take the cells and build the 3D tissues within this space... So it's kind of an organ-growing lab in a way. It is, absolutely. This sophisticated robot is the bioprinter. It squeezes out half a millimeter wide cylinders of bio ink. The ink's just clusters of human cells, remarkably holding themselves together in the correct shape, just with natural adhesion. Six cylinders of cells are laid on each other to make a tubular blood vessel. In this cross-sectional diagram, the red circles represent the walls of the vessel. This is a fully human blood vessel that we've created with the bioprinter uh, here on the plate. And so you can see it's three-dimensionality um, just as you turn the plate yeah, slightly. Yeah, yeah. Again, the cells have assumed their correct positions in the vessel by themselves. There's no scaffolding holding this together. So how are the cells going to go? They're smarter than we are in a lot of ways. They're inherent properties. I think it's uh, you know it's leveraging the qualities that cells naturally have, which is to stick to each other. We are able to control the shape in which they do that, and then the printer builds the ultimate structure. The next step is to give the cells nutrients and then put them in the incubator overnight. There, they'll continue to self-arrange and form a vessel. After a night in the incubator and with a bit of cleaning, this is what you get a replacement blood vessel made out of your cells. This blood vessel is the width of a few human hairs. Back in North Carolina, they're developing another application for bioprinting, for wounds. One of the strategies is to have a printing machine that not only prints, but also scans. So basically the patient is first scanned, so the wound area gets a scan of the wound, and then we're able to go back with the printer and print the right layers of tissues where right they belong. Now, for most organs, there's still a long way to go before they'll be ready for patients. But research is progressing on artificial kidneys, heart valves, large blood vessels, and skin. Here it's been slowly stretched out. They're even working on artificial ears and fingers. Of course, fingers is still a long time away of us actually getting that into a patient. Uh, but the ear is simpler than a digit, and we're creating ears in the project we're doing right now with the military to provide these kinds of structures to our uh, injured warriors. Even muscles are up for replacement. To create artificial muscle, we use the same strategies as we have used with other tissues, but we also exercise them. We put them in these mobile reactors, these exercise machines, that actually stretch and compress the muscle structures so they build up strength over time before we implant them. But the organs most in demand are kidneys and livers. And Anthony's team recently had a breakthrough. They developed miniature livers that functioned like human ones in the lab at least. But artificial liver and kidney transplants are some way off because they're so complicated. The kidneys have a very complex structure because it's a solid organ. And so unlike other structures like flat structures such as skin, which are the simplest, tubular structures like blood vessels or urethras, which are a second level of complexity, or even the bladders, which are a third level of complexity, the kidneys are a solid organ and have a fourth level of complexity. And therefore you have a lot more cell types, so it requires much more sophisticated methods for engineering. 
Still, fixing up livers and kidneys may be closer than you think. We may be able to patch them. If you take chronic kidney disease, for example, by the time a patient shows up at the doctor to say that I don't feel well, they are usually down to less than 10% of the function of that organ. That says you don't need the whole organ to be replaced to feel well. The tissue that is required to replace is actually only 10 to 20% to change the way that patient feels, change their quality of life, and, and really uh, be effectively a cure for them. Predicting the timing for any research is always difficult, but it's clear some pretty exciting developments are on their way. There'll be so many people, like Luke, who will benefit. 3D bioprinting is able to uh, bioprint a two-dimensional tissue, so you, you can print skin and cartilage. There was this case of a baby chest who had a spleen because he couldn't breathe, and they, they printed the spleen and they put it inside the baby, and then the cells grew on top of the spleen, and then um, the, the spleen eventually uh, disintegrated and allow the baby to develop properly. Um, so if you have to do, uh, the, there is also the possibility of printing tissues to text experiment drugs and to see the prognosis of diseases. There is also the possibility of uh, bioprinting hollow tubes, like the ones we saw in the video. And eventually, the idea is to print solid organs. So if we're going to do that, we have the the bioprinter. Um, you can see that they, there are four different packages. There is one with collagen, there is another one with uh, fibroblasts, uh, there is another, say, an, another one of the cartridges who has um, a, something called the fugitive ink that it injects the ink and then once it's cool then it becomes liquid and it allows the ink to just go away, leaving the empty space for the for the tubes, and there is also the ink for the stem cell or for the cells. The cells usually, what but they try to use is stem cells because they regenerate. Um, so that would be the four different types of ink. Um, the problem, though, is that for that ink to uh, to work or for the organ to or, or the tissue to work, um, it has to understand the functionality, um, the way it actually interacts with other cells. It has to be able to, in the case of the baby, to be able to disintegrate, to not cause an immune response from the body. So all uh, and even the vascularity in the case of uh, of the solid organs and the kidneys. So that's why the the ink it started just by like printing like regular uh, papers and a flat surface, and it went to 3D printing. And I forgot my son's 3D printer, but he actually created some hipster glasses with plastic. Originally, in that printer, it was with plastic with ceramics with gold, with uh, silver. Now we're switching to, to the stem cells. So if you think about the purpose of the bioprinting, if you think about what needs to be done, what type of commercialization would you use? So because we have like <laughs> like two minutes literally, um, we're, we're going to have the brainstorming just in the spot. So, anyway. Well, the industrial design, would okay. that come into play? Industrial design of what? Of, of the device itself. And then the technologies that uh, come together in that device would be patentable. Exactly. So, if we go back to the to how it looks, you, would, you can have a, not only an industrial design, because remember that industrial design can have a non-utilitarian can have a utilitarian purpose. So even like if it looks like all whitey and and clean, that would be the industrial design, how this looks. But if you talk about the different instruments and the different parts, it would be a patent. Uh, you can get a patent over the whole printer, the same way you can get a patent over the little uh, instruments. What else would you get? Gabby, I'm looking at each of the different types of ink. 
whatever goes into that so. Exactly, and there would be a patent on the compositional matter. However, there would be an issue whether you can get a patent on the stem cells. Exactly. Yes. Um, well, the other thing which for me is, is makes me think is that what you want to do is literally imitate nature. Mm -hmm. So you're not inventing anything in a way, you're just copying what's already existing. But it doesn't, it's not the same. Like if you think about the, the ear, it yeah. looks the same. Mm -hmm. However, it, like I'm pretty sure that if you pinch that ear, it's not going to hurt. So it is a little bit different. Well, uh, during embryonic development, we have a completely different process uh, as compared to what the 3D printer yeah. does. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so we're not replicating nature in that way. So the process we're playing itself. gods, yeah. but mm -hmm. we're, we are not, we're not gods. Mm -hmm. We're just playing. Yeah, well, it's just to say that it seems like some, it would be easier to patent some aspects of it than others. Uh, so the machine, uh, the printer that we're looking at is a machine that it's, to my mind, a fairly patentable subject material. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the organs that come out of that could be more difficult to, to patent. Uh, it seemed maybe they would be co covered by uh, copyright. Uh, I'm just thinking off the top of my head because, I mean, they have the sort of the minimal spark of ingenuity that it takes to be covered by. However, they're not different. They're not that different. If you think about that ear, probably looks a lot like mine. Yeah. Um, however, you did bring a very important thing. Um, organs are not patentable. According to the manual of the uh, patent office yeah. uh, practices, ma uh, organs and higher life forms are not patentable. In the States, everything invented by humankind under the sun, new, it's patentable. However, in, this, in Canada, uh, the onco mouse, the mouse with cancer cells and all that, that's not patentable and that's when the, the court also said not organs are not patentable. And why do you think are not patentable? So when you say organs, you mean the, the products of this yeah. tree? Okay. Yeah. Well, because those uh, cancer types or cell types, they, they are natural. It's not some invented type that does not exist in nature. In the onco mouse, yes, but, there's also but, the the but in these organs, it's the medical aspect. Exactly, aspects. exactly. because remember the the use of rights and the fair dealing and all these um, restrictions to intellectual property is because you don't want to limit the access to healthcare. So organs are not patentable. The ink would be patentable. Yes. Maybe the, the stem process, cells would be pro the, process the process would be patentable. You get the code that goes behind um, this thing also is this. Okay. No, not patentable. That's uh, hmm? copyrighted. Copyrighted. Mm -hmm. I suppose mm -hmm. this. Um, so we have the hardware. Um, we're missing also the software. You, if you remember in the video, the the person was talking about scanning. So it uses a computer, and that computer requires a software. And that software would be copyright. 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 <laughs> um, you well, yeah, you mentioned, and then trademarks. Mm -hmm. That would be maybe the North Carolina Center of blah 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 um, trademark. But that would be it. And um, if you remember the tools of commercialization, what type of tools would you use? Licensing, yeah. What else? What type of licenses? Uh, I don't remember the type, but I guess you can do one with um, maybe a, a hospital and they can use your technology. A protected commons? Protect, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I'm so happy. <laughs> um, would any, do you think that this type of technology, considering that we're not yet on uh, bioprinting, uh, solid organs like kidneys. Um, do you think that a company could just take on all the investment that is required? Probably not. So uh, having a public-private partnership could also be an, an option. Having the government, especially because it's a healthcare issue, maybe the government would be interested in pushing a little bit forward this technology so it, it actually comes 
into market uh, faster. Um, you can also have an open innovation model when you have different parties trying to make the process faster. You could also get, like all of you guys are in university, so you would be publishing on this. You're missing the copyright on your papers. Um, and maybe even the presentation that I'm recording here. Well, I was thinking about it because it's a university and probably this research was done using public funds, using university facilities. So, and there were papers on uh, predating this development of this 3D printer and including it. Uh, that was just published in a regular science journal. So, how does it all come together? You know, how do maybe it would be a spin off company and then do a partnership with Exactly. You can have a spin off company. I am so happy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so satisfied. Um, so, any questions? I think we're done. Yeah. Well, just the images, pretty images of what we could commercialize and how we can. Oh, I just want to mention there's also researchers who are growing these organs without 3D printing. They're growing mini kidneys and using a little different technology or yeah. cell cell <laughs> If If, if uh, organs were patent, of, uh, there couldn't be these two parallel exactly. lines of research. Exactly. Yeah. So that's why it's so important that even though you know the, the importance of intellectual property, you also know the limitations and therefore you kind of navigate. Yeah. Where do you draw the line between an organ and an artificial organ, though? Uh, because, I mean, something like an artificial heart, for example, uh, I'm pretty sure it can be patented. Uh, whereas, oh, mechanic, uh, a mechanical heart. Yeah. Uh, I would say that in that case would be the composition of the heart. That, because if you remember the exceptions, um, it was the... Um, the, the biological, essentially biological methods to produce, reproduce, and propagate plants and animals. So, like, I, I understand that, you know, we're not plants. But um, in that case, I would say that if you're using stem cells, it would be more difficult to patent than if you're using... And, and the problem also with the stem cells is that the stem cells... Uh, technology is supposed to be able to be biocompatible. So if I'm providing the stem cells, do I get a patent over my organ? Because um, I would get a patent over my composition of matter. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're talking about a heart made of metal so it's the, or the, plastic. The use of um, the, the patient's own biological materials would be the... It's, it's very, exactly. It's, it's very... Um, subjective. There, there's no like a clean line of what's patentable and what's not. That's why you usually have to go and that's why it also uh, um, costs that much between three and ten thousand dollars because the patent agent, uh, the at the SIPO is gonna is gonna have to understand your technology and and determine <coughs> whether it's patentable or not. And even then, after you may counter a lawsuit and you end up in the Supreme Court having to deal with lawyers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The financial uh, support for patenting, and the patenting is, is really, really cost, and that cost effective uh, work. Uh, and if, for example, we as individual, without um, asking university to help us, want to patent our idea, <laughs> Who can help us, or which organization, governmental organization, can give us some loans to, to you know, finance? There are some uh, funding agencies that have specific funds for commercialization. So you can apply and, and say, my technology, for instance, CIHR, has some funds for commercialization. So you can apply for those funds, and they will evaluate your application and decide whether it's um, worthwhile to, to patent. If you're in the university, you can go to the university. Uh, university on the, in my case, they just work on uh, professors, a researcher, mm -hmm. but my work is just my work and uh, no professor has not uh, you know, supported me for developing this idea and this patent. Mm -hmm. um, so but you can also go to the, to the um, I forgot the name. Office of uh, uh, Research Sponsor, okay. uh, Sponsor Research. Okay. Um, they they can you can go there, and you can ask for some guidance. They can tell you 
which partners can you approach? Is mm -hmm. if we go back to the spin-off uh, mm -hmm. companies, you they can help you to approach and how to approach certain potential partners, or how to start up uh, a spin-off company, or to how to apply to certain funds. Okay. So there's mm -hmm. always that like mm -hmm. support. Okay. Great. Thank you. So we're done. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you.